So he starred in uh, The Big Valley and The Virginian and later The Fall Guy among more than 100 TV and film credits, a nearly 60 year career in Hollywood, wrapped around, of course, his most famous role over here today for Colonel Steve Austin in The Six Million Dollar Man. Here is the legendary Lee Majors. Hey, Jerry. How are you, my friend? Lee, welcome back to Wizard World. I say welcome back because you've been a, a, a guest of ours a few times at shows. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you know, I am in the Houston area. I feel like I'm in the capsule getting ready to take off here. And well, we're excited about that. Uh, we're going forward with the side stick, huh? <laughs> exactly. So also Hollywood royalty. She's in almost 100 TV shows and films, everything from guest spots on huge hits like The Rockford Files and Marcus Welby, MD, to Hallmark movies, dozens of TV films. Of course, her most well-known role, Jamie Summers, in uh, both The Six Million Dollar Man and her own spin-off series, The Bionic Woman. Here is the great Lindsay Wagner. Hey. Welcome back also to you, Lindsay, uh, as a, a Wizard World guest. It's been a little while since you've been at one of our shows, but you were also a guest for us a few times, so we appreciate that. <laughs> well, it's obviously great to see both of you guys. Uh, I'm in a couple of the fan groups, and they've been buzzing with excitement for this Q&A that's coming up, so uh, we can't uh, be more excited uh, than we are to, to have you guys both here. Let me start with a question that's kind of open for you that you can kind of get kind of going with. What do you think has made these series and these characters resonate with fans? I mean, it's 45, 50 years later, people are still loving this series and loving these characters. What, what made this, these series so great? Hi, I want to say hi to Lindsay. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, if you want me to start, or would you like to start, my dear? Well, my thought was, my thought that was just coming to me was that there's just a lot of heart in them both. Their action and, you know, espionage and all that kind of stuff. But there was so much heart and humanity in it. And that's not always the case. It's usual, you know, these days it's a lot about adrenaline. And there was some then, of course, when they were little kids. And in those days, adrenaline was only about took this much to get the adrenaline going. Today, it's like, you got to decapitate people to get the adrenaline going, so they do. It's, it was a different time, it was a kinder time. And I think we covered a lot of, a lot of genres in one, as well as being for the kids, and, and the parents seemed to love it, so. I also think it was a, a show that uh, most families could watch together with their kids. There was no uh, violent, uh, scenes in any of the shows and we just had a wonderful time doing it and I know I've heard from so many families that said they got together on whatever night it was and got around the tv and it was something that they could all watch together and we were very proud of that that, uh, that it was a family show. And also the, the, the Bionic Woman was the groundbreaking show for women in a powerful role but, um, it was just it was the first time it had been on TV. So as far as women were concerned, that was just a huge, huge thing. And that, and that's I think there's a lot of sentimentality about that. Um, and, and even by men, you know, I, I had a lot I have had a lot of men tell me things as they've gotten older uh, because they didn't want to admit it as they were younger that they used to watch the Bionic Woman or they'd make an excuse to go home and be with their tell their friends that they had to go babysit their little sister because they wanted to watch the Bionic Woman with her for real. That's why they went home. But that the show, and I was really moved by this, I must say, when a couple of people started telling me this, um, and that through that show, they learned that strength and sensitivity can exist in the same person. Though I was a woman bringing it, adding that strength, which usually is related to um, a male, so certainly in the back in, back in those days, um, up to that point in history, physical strength was a male thing. And so having that and the sensitivity kind of awakened, I think, in some men, hey, wait a minute, I can do that. Or just to be strong. And so that was really a su wonderful surprise when I started learning. 
you also had the the continuity of, of characters uh, even through the two different series. And I have a, a question here from at Tio Gennaro. And Tio asks, was Richard Anderson the best or was Richard Anderson the very best? Well, if you don't mind, I would say Richard Anderson was even very, very, very best. He was a sweetheart of a man, a wonderful actor. He made us made us feel good every time we came to work. He was such a classy guy. We called him old money because he was always uh, dressed to the T. He looked good. But the only thing is I would like to have his job, uh, you know, dictating to Lindsay and I what mission we were going to be on go out and do all this stuff. And then we come back in and he's behind his desk. And he says, good job. <laughs> I would have liked that. I'm sure Lindsay would have too. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have to jump. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, what's funny. He was such a classy guy. Always the way he dressed was like very, and his cars and the classic antique cars. And, but you'd see him on the set and, uh, here he is, and he never wore socks. It's like he's got always in his suit, you know, with this shirt and a tie, and you're sitting, you're sitting on the set and his legs are stretched out while he's waiting for it to go on. And you look and it's like, Richard, you're not wearing any socks. I don't like socks. It's like, okay. It's like, it, it almost reminded me of those, that when artists in, in Asia and other cultures, uh, I think Native Americans do it as well. When they do a beautiful piece of art, they always want to do one something that isn't right or that's a little broken or just quite off because they say nothing in life is perfect and if they're going to do art and rep that represents the part of life that they want that to be like that so um that was his that was his little tweak on not being so perfect <laughs> he was a great tennis player that's for sure and i must say that i had just bought a new car finally finally was able to afford to buy a new car and we, uh, we were out one evening and we went out to dinner somewhere. We parked it in a place that probably not, it was near the restaurant or whatever. But anyway, we came out and the, the car was gone. Somebody had stolen the car. But the only thing Richard was worried about is he left his umbrella in the car. And so for years and years and years, I would keep hearing him say, you know, I really miss that umbrella. So, but he was, he was okay. We love him and we miss him so much. Yeah, he, he was a frequent guest at Wizard World shows as well. And, you know, we're just people who work at Wizard World, but he made us all feel like we were the most important people. I got back from one of the shows and, and on my desk is a FedEx with the, with the whole series. When you guys were coming out with the series, like the man was the, I, I love you guys, but, but he's my all time favorite Wizard World guest. Good for you. To, to give you that. He, he is my all time favorite, which uh, is, is a good choice as everyone has told me. So Lee, I have a question about the, um, the, the pilot or, or the pilot. So there was a pilot and then there was another pilot and then there was another pilot. And then you finally, you're the only one who was in all of them. What do you remember what kind of went on there? Why, why did they take so many fits and starts to finally get this thing going? Well, the first one, uh, the pilot was, probably what, two hours, all these were two hours, I think. And uh, they were working out some logistics with the, the running, you know, when they first started out, uh, you know, they had, they, they sped up the camera. I mean, it looked like the, the Keystone cops running around in the old days, if you saw those films. And then they got it down to where we could do it in slow motion and it looked really, really good. But I was always wondering that myself because we did three, three movies before we went to series. And each of them were off the charts as far as ratings. And I just always wondered, oh, now you're going to go to series? And then if you, if you, if you know that we were on for, uh, I don't know, five or six years, five years or so, but then when we went off the air, there was three more movies made, three more. And they were all successful. So I don't really know why they took it off the air to begin with or why they didn't put it on the air earlier. So that's all I have to answer to that question. Yeah, and Lindsay, on, on your pilot, so it ended up being a backdoor pilot where the two-part episode on Six Million Dollar Man was, was featured on Bionic Woman, but they killed off Jamie 
But this was 1975. So you couldn't go on Twitter and say you wanted it or on Facebook. People had a call. People had a write. And they did. And, and you got a series out of it. Do you remember how that all kind of went down and, and how people made your show happen? Yeah, well, it was it was uh, twice when they killed her off. Um, people wrote in and, and they were they were they were angry. That that was the first time because it really traumatized the kids. I mean, Steve Austin was the, kind of the, the Superman, if you will, of the previous generations of people, um, the quintessential male father figure, and. And then they created the female version of that. And then they killed it right in front of all these kids. Um, and they, they were just traumatized, a lot of them. There were, some of the letters even came from children's hospitals. Um, there was that one from, I think, Boston's Children's Hospital or uh, one in New York. I can't remember where the other one was. But, they uh, they were just talking about what irresponsible programming and here's what happened to the kids, as well as all the parents that wrote in. So they needed to bring her back. And that's how Jamie ended up being a school teacher at the Air Force Base because they wanted the kids to know that she was okay once they brought her back, but they still wouldn't wasn't weren't gonna put her on the series. We're gonna keep her because that just wasn't the franchise, that wasn't the formula of the show to have a, a couple. And so they ended up um, making her a school teacher, which was smart because then the kids felt like she was with them. And, uh, and the amnesia was how she didn't have to be on his show all the time. Could be once in a while. And you were on separate networks, but, but also yeah. this show, what this show was, well, originally you weren't, but then at the end, but that was, way I, that was the last later season. at the very end. Right. But also, this show was for kids, right? I mean, you just said it. This show, it worked for adults, but it also worked for kids. So a lot of the other shows of the 70s, the cop shows and the lawyer shows, those were adult shows. And then you had your kid shows. But this, the whole family really could watch. I watched it when I, when I was seven and eight. I couldn't wait to get home to watch it. Yeah. So that's when they brought her back again, was when now people wrote in because they liked it. And that's how... The, the third thing happened, which I'm was pretty crazy. sure. I'm pretty sure I one of those letters. ABC has one of those letters that I, I say a few words before you leave that subject, please. Uh, I, I think Lindsay knows this story a little bit, but uh, you know, I had finished the whole first season and I started the second. And I, I, I said to the producers, you know, and I said, you know, we've gone so long and I haven't even had a love interest in the show. And I said, I'm tired of looking at the hairy leg crew guys that are working on this show. So they finally went and wrote me a love story. And uh, they just were so happy. And, and they cast the right lady. And uh, we had a good time. But the thing is, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have anything to do with killing her off, though. So I'm certainly happy that they brought her back. I'm so proud of her that she went on and did her own series. And she, she's a great lady and a wonderful actress and to work with. So, and we've worked with several times since then. Yeah. yeah especially the, re the reunion movie. So we did have a question uh, from a few different folks asking about this, um, the, the reunion movies. What, what was your favorite of the reunion movies? Well, let me start. I, I, mine was uh, the last one because finally, Finally, we got married in Charleston, South Carolina. And I thought that was a perfect ending. But then, you know, Lindsay and I were talking not long ago. I said, if they ever brought it back, we'd probably be doing it in an old age home somewhere. <laughs> well, the thing is about the reason there was a wedding in that one was because when they came to me and said they wanted to do a third one, I said, I won't do it unless we get married in it. Because I said, you cannot force my marriage up. Huh? You forced the marriage on me. <laughs> All right. I'm so happy though you did. You just can't, you can you can't keep dragging this generation of people through this unrequited thing for you know, everybody's waiting for this to happen. So let's you can I'll keep doing them, but you gotta you gotta get them married first. Jay, why don't you tell them about the one we did in Canada? 
with uh, an unknown actress that was trying to be the next bionic woman. Yeah. Huh. Yes. Um, you guess who that is, Jerry? <laughs> you want to tell him that story? Tell us the story. <laughs> actress we were working with. Nobody knows who that was. Well, are you you're talking about Sandra? Yeah, so, sorry, Sandra Bullock. Yeah, she was she was just a young actress that had done a few little parts and hadn't done anything for a big. And, and she came on the show and was hired to perhaps become the next bionic woman, the next generation. And so she was this, the guest star of that whole show, and we went through it. And then at the end of it. Um, the studio, we were all going, she's, she's good, you know, she's natural, she's young, she's, she'll get even better because she's just starting. And, and they just said, nah, we don't think she can carry a series. That was the studios. That was the studio. Oops. Sandra <laughs> <laughs> cannot carry a series. Uh, right. And we were going, no, we kept rooting for her. Said, Look at she. That was just crazy. Also, there was a funny thing happened in the... Well, the two funny things, but the one that stands out in my mind was she was kind of so green that she wasn't, you know, when you're on camera and you're doing an over the shoulder, you had in the, in the person whose shoulder is the camera's going over toward you. If they aren't aware, they will start leaning on natural body thing. We kind of do that when we don't realize we're doing it. We started leaning into the camera and when you are a seasoned actor, you can usually catch that from your perspective and you know it. So you stay your character and you just start leaning with them, right? So that you don't have to do the darn scene again. And it was late and I didn't want to do it. And she, so when I lean, somehow she just entrained with my mind and she started leaning more because I was leaning. And now she's leaning, I'm leaning, and I didn't want to do the scene again. So I kept doing the dialogue, kept doing the dialogue. And by the time I said, by the time they said cut, the, the, um, the whole crew just fell out because everybody saw it happening and everybody started laughing. And she's like, what? She didn't even know what was funny. And it was so cute when we told them she was having There's no embarrassed. We all, have, we all go through that at one point or another and then you learn. <laughs> so that was Christian Craig, at Christian Craig, who gave us that question. Thank you, Christian. We have a few people ask this question. Mia, Sarah, uh, John Villas, similar questions. They want to know if you guys preferred Andre the Giant or Ted Cassidy as Bigfoot? And what oh, did each of them bring to the role as a little bit different? Oh, without a doubt, Andre the Giant for me. And I'll, I'll do a quick story, but I had to do a fight with him, which lasted all day. It was a very, very hot day out in the woods. And he had to, uh, the, the scene was where he would pick me up and throw me and then come running towards me and then jump in and, and land on me, okay? Well, he threw me a little bit further than I thought he was going to. And, uh, and, I, and then I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, the sun disappeared. It was dark, and I figured I'm about to get crushed. When he landed on me, he never touched me, I swear. He was he's such a professional wrestler. Uh, that's how great he was. But then when we say cut, we would go over to our chairs, and we always had a six-pack of beer ready for him. He would take each beer, drink it down, crush the can. Six times he did that. And he would do it just about all day long. But the only thing is, it always amazed me. I never saw him go to the bathroom. <laughs> Here's the inside story right here. I got to tell you, that suit smells horrible. Oh, God. It's not like it was fresh made for that character. No, it's probably hard to dry clean that in between takes. I wouldn't want to have been the wardrobe lady who had to do that suit every day. <laughs> great just to so uh, we have, uh, well, we got questions from folks, um, you know, a lot of them beforehand, a lot of them are in the chat rooms now, and we just appreciate everybody, um, you know, being with us. John Bradbury asks um, for both of you, for Lee, what was your favorite part of the series that you enjoyed doing the most? And, and same to Lindsay for you on, on, on Bionic Woman and, and the crossovers. Well, uh, John, the best part for me was actually doing all the stunt work. We had, uh, we were fighting every day, but the, the locations were terrible. We'd be shooting in empty factories, 
empty utility plants. It was so desolate, fighting the $7 million man, John Saxon, all day long, too. Uh, but after a while, I, 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 but I'm going to tell you, it, it, it was a very, very physical show. I'm sure Lindsay can tell you that. And if you're running towards camera from uh, 50 yards away, and you go by camera, and they say, cut, and they say, well, we have to do it again. You're out of focus. And on about the fifth time after you've done that, you kind of look at the focus guy and you say, look, if you don't get it this time, you're not going to get it, period. So you better get this thing in focus. But the fights stuff, uh, now I guess I can tell you, I, I wish I had used my stuntman more uh, at my age now because I just had both knees replaced last year. Oh, and just had the cataract surgery on one eye. Thank God it wasn't my bionic eye. But uh, all those uh, stunts, you, you come to uh, feel them many years later. So that was my part of the show. Go ahead, Lindsay. Not my favorite part of the show. <laughs> I was then uh, running and everything. I, I used to say that um, I think God brought me the bionic woman to be, punish me because I refused to recognize. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, I'll get you one way or the other. <laughs> Um, that I, I, I would drive to the mailbox if I could have. Uh, but I think for me, it was, um, there was just a lot about it. It's funny, I never thought about what was my favorite thing or my favorite part. Well, you know, let, me, let me focus it a little then. Um, do you had a, did you have a favorite storyline that kind of went on? Uh, Mike Dolan asked me a question about that favorite storyline or, or or what happened in the series? Well, you know, I love kids and I loved working with the kids. I mean, there was a lot of things that I liked about the shows. I had one of my favorite shows was one that um, I worked very closely with Ken Johnson and it was um, biofeedback because, uh, you know, I, I'm a meditator. I have been since I was 19. And so the body, the mind and spirit connection, the ability that we have to heal, heal our body with our mind and transcend what we think we are is a big, always has been a big part of my life and was when I was doing the Bionic Woman. So that show was really important to me, that particular one, the storyline of it. Um, That's neat. Nancy McCants uh, had a similar question as well to that. So we appreciate, uh, we appreciate Nancy uh, with that. So uh, Kimberly's Corner, on the, on the same realm, but maybe a little different. What was your favorite bionic feature? And did you have a feature that you wish you had as, as a bionic uh, that you didn't have in the show? If you ask my kids, they'll say she did have a bionic ear. <laughs> she did have exceptional hearing. <laughs> I mean, they could never get away with anything. Or whispering in the house or whatever. It's like, How did you hear that? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Favorite part? Yeah. Funny, you know, I don't even think about it. It's just like, you just do it. People used to say to me, boy, I wish I had that. Or I wish I could run like that. Or, like, I hear that all the time. It's like, yeah, well, come out here with me in July and we'll go running across the, the, those fields that we have to run in in the middle of the heat and the, you know, sweating. And I, I, I passed, I wasn't very good. Lee was a, an athlete. I, I was not an athlete, as I just confessed. But, um, and so sometimes I'd actually... Get, like almost pass out in the when we were working in in some of the areas that we worked because it was just so hot. I mean, that was we were out there all day long. So that that was tough. That was a tough part for me. Yeah, we had a great crew though. Love the people working together and fun and a lot of laughter. And you know, it wasn't we didn't have to focus on <laughs> heavy stuff, doing a lot of drama, which is how I ended up what I ended up doing uh, subsequently. But um, so it, it was. Funny. Lee, did you have a favorite attribute? Did you like the eye better or the running? What was kind of your favorite part of that bionic? Uh, well, the running was okay. The running was okay, except after you've done it for seven or eight takes. <laughs> Another thing is, back in the 70s, you know, we had these 70s uh, show, uh, designs and clothing, and naturally they were bell bottoms which were about a foot long at the bottom and try running through the woods 
with that flapping in the breeze, catching on every branch uh, that it could. And I probably fell down many times just because of that. So that wasn't, uh, but I wish I had her bionic ear now. And I could use that now a little bit better. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm glad I had them all. I could have had a few more. Maybe a brain chip, make me smarter. <laughs> Want to remind everyone that if you're um, watching live or on the replay and you're interested in the live video chats or the autographs or the recorded videos, uh, go to wizardworldvirtual.com. It'll have the schedules for the upcoming events, but also Tuesday, uh, this Tuesday coming up at two o'clock Eastern, we're going to have the um, live video chats, the one-on-one -on -one video chats, opportunities with Lee and Lindsay. You won't want to miss those. You can get both of them. So uh, you can go in there and uh, the autographs, the recorded videos as well that they'll do for you after. That's a, a great opportunity to, uh, to just do a little bit more. We're having a lot of fun today and we're getting to a lot of questions, but there's so much we're not going to get to. And uh, we want to hopefully uh, you know, get everyone a chance to, to get some time. Uh, Jeff Healy 8, at Jeff Healy 8, wants to know who some of your favorite guest stars were. There were always great guest stars on the programs. Who were some of your favorites? Oh, there was a lot. <laughs> um, I, um, <laughs> you have asked me that a few years ago before I got to be this age and I can't remember names. <laughs> well, you know, here's one, just for example, we could talk about John Saxon, who we just recently lost uh, last month. He was in a couple episodes, Lee. Uh, and he played a, a you know an evil villain, and he played a, a friend who was a villain in, in one of the episodes. Also, it turned out to 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 be a dual role. Uh, talk either about him or someone else that uh, that that kind of is important to you guys for the show. Well, yeah, I mentioned John a few minutes ago uh, because it was a seven million dollar man where they made him up as a robot. Also, and we had to fight all day again. They loved uh, loved for Steve Austin to fight all the time, you know, and uh, throw people around. But um, we, we just had so many wonderful guest people. Uh, it's hard to, it's such a blur now, if you know what I mean. Uh, a lot of a lot of people that I can't think of now, but, I, you know. He does. He does. Yeah, I mean, you had the Eric Braden. You had a lot of those character actors who you saw on a lot of 70s shows, and I thought they brought a lot to, to what we had here. I have another question here, a comment and question from Adam Retag. Adam says, Lindsay and Lee, thanks so much for a wonderful childhood. Your characters were like surrogate parents and role models for many of us at a certain age. Do you realize the influence you had on children growing up? Do you realize it in the moment and do you realize it now? Well, in the moment, we were hoping. <laughs> we were just doing our best to do something that we thought was good and inspiring and for kids, but also uh, meaningful and you know, showing Getting more of their their personal potential rather than just you know, looking at people as more human beings rather than the good guy and the bad guy, which is kind of just too narrow of a scope, especially since TV was just becoming a thing. I mean, you know, television isn't that old. Kids today have no clue that people didn't grow up, anybody alive didn't grow up with television. And it's... So it was becoming a big thing, and that was very important to me. We were watching more and more and more. So it was becoming a huge influence on the development of children's minds. <clears throat> so that was that was kind of thing was, was very important about it. When we uh, when we do the shows, we always have a lot of people in our lives that say that uh, they grew up watching us, and they're adults now. And they're also some of them would say that that's why they went into the military. That's why they became a uh, pilot. We have them saying that that's why they went into the medical, uh, being doctors and surgeons and stuff. Uh, and, and a lot of tech people, a lot of technology people got into technology uh, with that. And then um, of course, we always ask them, well, I hope you didn't get hurt when you were little, trying to jump off the the front porch or the barn or something. But then sometimes they say, well, I did break my arm trying to be Steve Austin. But uh, it's such a, um, a great honor and uh, a real treat to hear from these people. And and I think <clears throat> Lindsay can tell you that we probably didn't know how things started at this show or how much it was watched when we were doing it, actually. Because um, it's only in the last 10, 
15 years where I've been able to travel around the world and, and, and go to places to where I didn't even know they had TV back then and, and realized how much, how far this should reach. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of countries. So we're, we're very honored by that. We're proud of the fact that we were able to uh, provide some entertainment. Yeah, I think, I think everyone I knew when I was growing up had this lunchbox. There's the lunchbox. Uh, and, and, you know, and they also had these, the action figures. So tell the action figures. First of all, do you guys have any of the action figures still? And do you know anyone who didn't have the action figures? Well, I understand them. I didn't know anybody who had the action figures because I was working. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're a little older than you, so <laughs> our friends weren't. <laughs> we, we didn't, I would assume that Lindsay and I both didn't uh, didn't even know how much merchandise was out there that they had put out. Because back then, we never saw, we never got to approve it or anything. And believe me, we don't get a penny off of that. So, and people come up with the dolls and lunchboxes and rocket ships and all kinds of things for us to sign. And we go, oh, there's something I've never seen before. And I'm sure Lindsay's had, had to do that too. Uh, but, and they're still, the doll has gotten smaller as I see. It used to be like a foot. And then the last ones I've signed were down about, oh, um, about six inches. So they keep getting smaller and smaller. It's almost like the Fall Guy truck. I signed it. Uh, it it's shrunk from a, a, a foot and a half truck down to about eight inches of truck. So merchandise we don't control, we don't get any frank, anything from it, and uh, but we will sign it for you, which is always fun. And, and and everyone, I know everyone has had one. So Carlotta Barber has a question um, uh, related. A couple other people had similar, but her question was that she noticed that some of the the episodes had similar storylines. Then you had the crossover episodes. Do you, did you guys share scripts a lot? Did Lindsay when you were doing? Bionic Woman, did you know what was happening over on the other show and where there might be a, a chance where it crossed over again? Well, I didn't know what was going on if I wasn't in it. But in, I know in the very beginning, because it ha- it was so unexpected, the, Ken Johnson and the whole production team, they didn't have time to prep a series. They had to hit the ground running. And so they were trying to revamp some of the storylines from that they already had for Lee and just kind of put a new face on it for the first, you know, some of the first few. And then they got in a groove and were creating new stuff. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, we, we were contractually uh, obligated to do, what was it, two a season, Lee? Was it two, two, let me do two of his and him do two of mine. So we knew they were coming. It was just part of what they were. We not, we not only did crossovers, we were doing our own shows at the same time because the, the stages were relatively close. So I would finish a scene on, on, on my show and then run over to her show, change my clothes, and, and do a scene with her. She did the same thing. We're back and forth. And we understand that because when to get her started, uh, her show started off with a bang. We, that, that crossovers uh, made it a little, a little more popular for her and we're just so glad that she went on to carry it herself and she did a great job. And, and there were crossovers before kind of, but not really like this with this $6 million man and bionic woman crossovers. There were, there were storylines that I think one of the Bigfoot ones went from one to the other, back to the other for the third part. Like you really had to be interested in both. And I think almost everyone who enjoyed the $6 million man also loved the bionic woman and and back and forth, but I think that was part of you know what made the the both series so successful is that they even though you had independent storylines, everyone was following both. And, and again, it was during a time where you know you, you only had the three or four shows on. Yeah, you, you better be a good show, otherwise they're going to replace you with something else. Uh, Kin from the UK, another one had some good questions. We had Jay West Virginia. He has a question for Lee. He wants to know, being the character was an astronaut, have you become familiar with astronauts and what was it like filming at Kennedy Space Center for some of those episodes? Well, we filmed at uh, Cape Canaveral. Canaveral. And uh, I had the opportunity to 
<clears throat> to be in the facility exactly where they astronauts suited up. The same people that suited up the real astronauts suited me up in one of the one of the same suits and uh, gave me my little uh, uh, handheld uh, uh, air so that I could breathe once they got you in that thing. And then, I, then they take you out and they put you in a van and, and the van would take me out to the launch pad. And it's a, uh, you're the only one in the van and there's, there's glass, you know, you could look out. And I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking, this is the last thing that these astronauts are gonna see, maybe, you don't know. And I, I just felt how nervous they must have been. I know that I was nervous and I wasn't going anywhere. And then when we went up into the into the capsule, we went up by elevator. We were doing a scene where we get into the, the seats and then uh, smoke starts coming in and then we have to evacuate quickly. And there's only three ways to do that. One is the elevator, which is very, very slow. The next one is there's a thing out the side with a zip line on it and it's a basket. You jump in the basket and it'll take you a half a mile away pretty quick. But the quickest one, as soon as you get out of the capsule door, there is a hole in the wall, so to speak. And you go feet first down that thing and it swerves around and around and around and you come out into a small room, which they call the rubber room because it's, it's all padded with rubber. And I, I actually did that. And uh, it was kind of fun. You could spread your knees out so you can control your speed. The first time I did that, and the second time I went a little faster. Then I took a camera down on my stomach and so they could get a great shot at it. But they also told me that a lot of astronauts had some legs broken by coming out of that chute and hitting the wall on the other side. But they went as fast as they could, and it was, it was pretty dangerous for them just to practice that. So... Uh, and Lindsay, Sue Parnell has a question for you. And Sue uh, is, she says, it's heading into sunrise Sunday morning in North Queensland, Australia, at the point that she wrote this to us. She was binging on the show, uh, getting ready for this. And she noticed one thing in particular. She wanted to know if you ever read a script and thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to get bed sores because you spent so much time in some of those early episodes in, in the hospital bed. Was that a, a concern of yours or a thought when that was going on? No, not really. You know, it, it, it's the amount of uh, time that you see in your mind that's, let's see, how do I explain that? It's, it's, it's a mental illusion. You, you watch me being in bed for weeks in the show, but all of those scenes probably took about a day and a half to shoot. <laughs> a very different experience for you than it is for me. <laughs> I gotta say one thing that I, when I had my, my both knees uh, replaced this past year, my uh, surgeon uh, got quite a thrill out of that. And he said, I can't believe I grew up watching and now I am replacing the bionic knees. And so uh, I just hope that uh, there wasn't any jokes made while I was out uh, and, and during the surgery, but I'm sure they had a good time with that. So anyway, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've had uh, so many great questions from folks. Uh, Eric Shores wants to know, Lindsay, and you mentioned this at the very top, you talked about it, but maybe if you want to talk a little more, female action series leads, they were very rare in the 1970s. Did, did you feel any extra responsibility or pressure because of that? And, and look what it's led to, all the great series that have come since. Well, they weren't. Any, I mean, there were like uh, there were a couple of women as police officers. Wonder Woman. No, she was after Bionic. Oh, really? Uh, no, we were the first. We were the first woman having the lead, the lead. Whereas you have the women with two cops on either side of her, two male cops. Now, that was the formula. It was women's role, typical men's role. And so. Uh, yes, I mean, I felt pressure. I felt that's one of the reasons I wanted to do the show. I really didn't want to do a series. I was, I was starting to do features and I, I wanted to go into that area of filmmaking, but this 
was such an opportunity to talk to kids and to be able to put a woman in a man's role. And again, culturally at that time, it was a huge issue, huge in the beginning. The woman's movement, the shift of, of uh, how we perceive ourselves and what we do with our lives. And so I was very happy to be able to be in a show where I could express some of my thoughts about it and create a character that <clears throat> wasn't a man in a skirt because she's got a job where she's strong. <clears throat> and, I, and I worked very closely with Kenny, Ken Johnson, um, on the stories so that we could express them in a way that I felt represented more of what a woman might do or how she might handle a situation like that. It was just be too easy to write everything you wrote for any man that ever started in an action show and just have it be a girl. And so it was very consciously addressed. Yeah, it definitely shows when you, when you watch the series that, um, that they, they did make that effort to, um, to, to make it be that many of the same things that, that go on in those series, it's incidental to whether your character was a woman or a man. There are some things obviously that, you know, that, that were not, but, but th that's a pretty good thing. There was a lot of comments we've had in the, in the chat rooms right now about the fembots. Those episodes uh, involve both of you guys. Do you remember the fembots episodes and did you enjoy doing those? Did not enjoy wearing that costume. I'll tell you. <laughs> Those high heels. Plus, we were shooting in a in a place that was for real, uh, but there was not. It wasn't filled with people. There was no audience. It wasn't, it wasn't filled with people. It was just like a meat hanger. It was freezing in there. High heels, freezing. Hardly any clothes on. That giant thing on my head. It wasn't my favorite episode to film. I gotta tell you. And yeah, that was one that was a crossover that went to that went to both. Um, so we just have a couple minutes left. I, I want to give you guys an opportunity now, just kind of open the floor to each of you to talk about either projects you're working on or uh, some, some causes you're involved with or anything that's important to you that you want to let the fans know right now before we, uh, before we sign off. I'll we'll start with you, Lee. Oh, well, um, well, as you know, and as everybody knows, that uh, our industry has been shut down, so there's not too many projects going on yet. I just hope that um, this thing ends soon and everybody stays safe and healthy. And uh, it's, it's just a trying thing. And also, you know, with everything else that's going on in our country, I just uh, got to just hope that we get some, some answers and some peace soon. And, and also, uh, oh, I'd like to give a shout out and your old friend of mine up in Maine, his name is Thomas. And, uh, there is that. And not to uh, have the people to remember the virtual chats on Tuesday. Look forward to having some more conversations and, and more one on one time with uh, these people because, you know, and, and this kind of thing with, with so many people in the panel, it's a little different. But the one on one chats will be more fun, we hope. For sure. And Lindsay, for you? Yeah, I mean, I feel very much, of course, I echo everything you were saying about people and being able to connect again. It's been a, a long time, and it's it's going to be different because, you know, we keep shaking hands. And, <laughs> but, um, I've, I've been working on, I'm the, um, the president of the board of ICANN, and Associates, which is an organization of the Interagency Council of Child Abuse and Neglect. And uh, I've been working with them for 33 years. But and shortly, we're going to have a, one of, the, one of the projects that we do every year is um, there's a county-wide poster contest in junior highs. And uh, where there's a little program about child abuse and uh, uh, geared towards the kids and what and what their job what well, not their job but they have the opportunity to do is um, make posters they, they paint raw posters of what would they want to say to our community what do they want to say How, what do they want to talk about 
what aspect of that do they want to talk about, how do they want to talk about it. So it gives them a chance to kind of use art to, to express themselves on this issue. And then those posters, um, we kind of have a little bit of a, of a I say contest, I don't say contest, but it's a beautiful structure. Um, there is uh, runner-ups and winners for the best, most, which can, includes not just the ability to draw, but their ability to communicate through art. And, um, and then the posters, we do lots of different things with them, but for the first time, and we've kind of been pushed into it, but we're gonna continue to do this, I think, as an organization, because of the shutdown, we have been, um, we, we're, we're making a video instead of just having the ceremony that we usually have in person, we're actually doing a whole video. So you'll be able to see on um, I can for kids or just look for the I, I C A N. Um, and, and it's not ready yet, but it'll be up, in, I think, hopefully by October, certainly by November. The video that we're making, which is now going to, you'll see the whole poster. Kids that did it, you'll see a bunch of the posters that they do. And it's very exciting. You can learn a little bit about ICANN too. That's fantastic. And I'm sure fans uh, will continue to follow you on, on your Twitter, on social media. You'll have updates on that. Uh, what's, what's the best social media for you, Lindsay? Uh, well, it's uh, lindsaywagner.com and Lindsay. Yeah, yeah you'll find, I know that you're, you're checkmarked and you have an official um, a Twitter feed so folks can find things there and can find Lee as well. So, uh, wow, the, the, the 48 to 50 minutes here flew by as we knew they would. Lots of great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone. Dale Long, uh, Junior Reed, uh, Cloessie, a couple other folks that didn't get to get their questions in, but we appreciate you uh, you know, being with us today and, and, and being on here. And, and for, for us, the opportunity, everyone here to, to speak with Lee and to, and to speak with Lindsay and have you guys just kind of talk a little bit about the series. I can't tell you how much folks appreciate. We've done about a hundred of these at Wizard World uh, since we started back in March, um, not having shows live. And this was just a, this was a blast. I mean, personally, of course, for me, it was a blast, but just from seeing what's in the chat rooms, uh, lots of exclamation points, lots of uh, emojis. So we hope everyone just gives us a, one more kind of round of applause, one more uh, round of emojis for Lee Majors and Lindsay Wagner. A reminder fans, if you uh, want that uh, extra opportunity for those one-on-ones, the live video chats, they're coming up on Tuesday. So you've got between now and Tuesday to go to wizardworldvirtual.com to purchase those, to get the autographs, to get the recorded videos. Uh, those are all available at wizardworldvirtual.com as, lo- as well as the additional upcoming events we have uh, today at four o'clock in just an hour or so. If you stay with us, uh, iconic cartoon characters from all time. Uh, the voices will be on right here and we'll have a great time with that. So again, for Lee Majors and Lindsay Wagner, Uh, Thank you so much for joining us today on Wizard World Virtual Experiences, and we'll see you again really soon. Thanks, you guys. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like, like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.